Hello, I'm Gail. And hello, I'm Catherine. And we're delighted to welcome Dr. Martha Holstein to our session today on Advocates for Women Aging. For nearly five decades, Dr. Holstein has been engaged in the field of aging, including policy work, leading a national association, a member of think tanks, she's done college teaching, and, and uh, writing for publication. And you know, many years ago, she discovered a long-lasting interest, the interface of gender and age, and the broader issue of intersectionality. Martha then added social ethics and has taught college courses in that area. Her books include Ethics, Aging and Society, The Critical Turn, and my personal favorite, Women in Later Life, Critical Perspectives on Gender and Age. So welcome, Martha, to Women Over 70 and our series on Advocates for Women Aging. Very happy to have you here. Hi, Gail. So Martha, let's start. Why don't, help us understand what this means, the interface of gender and age and this broad issue of intersectionality. Okay. Well, because so many of the ways we think about gerontology happens to be a very individualistic, you know, it's up to you. You, you, you control how you age, you control how you're seen, and it, it ignores the fact that all these features of our identity, whether it's gender or race or class or religion, uh, really affect the way we age, but that, that sort of these, the way we generalize about aging we don't pay particular attention. And, you know, our, our country has become so, you know, even now with this Black Lives Matter, you hear people say, well, why, why don't all lives matter? Well, there's a very, and the same thing with old age. So when you say that, you know, all lives matter, you completely lose sight of the things that affect people because of the specific parts of their identity, whether it's race, mm -hmm. class, age, gender, sexual identity, uh, and Ch Chimamanda Adichie, uh, who wrote Americana, was a black woman from Nigeria, and in one of her TED Talks, she says, things happen to me, not because I'm a human, they happen to me because I'm a woman. And mm -hmm. same thing with, as you know, with Black Lives Matter, to talk about human lives matter, we would completely lose sight of what happens to people because of the color of their skin and their gender. So we think it's very, it's very liberating to say all lives matter, but you, then you don't fix what's broken that affect people because of their, and intersectionality is, you know, it, you know we're, we're, we're affected by our class simultaneously, our age, our background, all that. So there are many things, many things go into playing how we experience old age. And now with all what I call the rah-rah version of old age, this positive version <laughs> of old age, they never tell you who they're talking about. They just want to point this nice idyllic picture of oh, old age is just so wonderful and women in their 70s are just great. But they don't tell us who they are. They're all middle-class white women. Probably they are. And they lose sight of the fact that so many people have had no control over their lives ever. And so they're obviously not going to have the same old age for somebody who lived lived on a country club or played golf every day, who never had to go without a bad meal, who never had to live on food stamps. And so the we lose sight of how important these differences are and how people are when they're 70, 80, or 90. And because with the big push for positive aging, there's no uh, – my – the going back to it long ago, and you probably will remember when we used to say the personal is the political. Mm -hmm. Well, contemporary gerontology has no political agenda. You know, you, you're sure we want to preserve Social Security, but, po but politics is what's going to change the way these different parts of our identity uh, shape our experience of old age. So is this, I'm sorry, is this how the ethics entered into your well, thinking? Ethics enter, enter, my complaint about ethics um, is that we focus almost entirely, when, we, when ethics and aging sort of took shape, ethics and aging focused almost entirely on individual decision making at the end of life. And I objected to that because all our lives, we live in families, we live in communities, and we don't always get just what we want. 
But all this, all this focus on advanced directives, general powers of attorney for health care are highly individualistic. What do you want? Not what's good for your family, your friends. Maybe you've been married for 60 years. You didn't always get your own way. What happens if your husband or your children have really would, would suffer from following your wishes? On an, and you're going to be dead anyway. You know, why should you care? So ethics was so focused on the individual that it lost sight of the, 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 the kind of ethical, ethical problems that were raised by social inequality, by racial injustice, by all the other things that affect the way those are ethical problems. I mean, inequality is an ethical problem because it shapes the way we can experience our life. We talk so much about individual responsibility, about making choices about how we're going to live, not recognizing that certain people have the ability to make many choices and other people virtually have no chance because of the under the under the context of their lives. And a wonderful philosopher, George Agage, pointed out, we so focused on choice, we lose sight of thinking about meaningful choice. If I, if I was a vegetarian, which I am, and I lived in a nursing home, and they offered me steak or a pork chop, they're giving me a choice, but it's not really a choice because neither one of those are meaningful for me. I really want some rice and beans. So you have to, you have to give people choices that matter to them, and the only way you could do that if you provide broad social arena of things that for, in which they can choose. So, so I once gave a talk called Beyond Vanilla. And Beyond Vanilla says, we're, we're, as feminists, we're allowed to have raging emotions that tell us that we've got to deal with the context of people's lives, not just say, choose. Do you want a ventilator? Do you want a feeding tube? What, that's, that, that's really so, that's at the end of life. Who the hell cares? What happens all along our life? So I want to broaden the scope of what we think about when we think about ethics and aging. It's not only about making choices at the end of life. It's about creating the preconditions that people really do have choices about how to live. Wow. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, you know, it's political. It's yeah. political. I, I and mean, even now in the society in which we live right now. And let me give you a, a pretty kind of a graphic example about probably in the mid 70s when there was a big effort to change uh there was a, a group called Americans for generational equity and they decided that old people were, were ripping off society because you know we were we were no longer the poorest in america the poorest were kids as if kids are going out and renting their own apartments and buying their own food and part of the agenda of that particular group was to privatize social security and it, it didn't, that didn't, it didn't happen because it was very unpopular. But now, with all these efforts to, quote, save Social Security, one of the things that is on the agenda is raising the age for retirement. Okay. So let's say you're in Congress, you're a millionaire, um, and you're voting on this. And you can say, well, sure, people can work longer. Sure, if you're a legislator, you work three days a week. Uh, you have somebody do your laundry, somebody prepare your meals. Uh, sure, you can work longer, but what happen, what But if we look at we look at the different differential effects, if we take into account what about happens to women uh, who have been uh, who do not have the ability to say, "I'm not going to provide care anymore. I still have to cook. I still have to take care of things around the house." Uh, I need my social security. Those men who are making, who are saying, well, people could just, you know, live long. We'll, we'll, give it, we'll give it to them at 78 or 80 or whatever age. Uh, they probably don't even need social security because they've worked in jobs and had pensions all their lives. Whereas women have not, so they have no other source of income. So there they are. We're going to, we're going to gradually raise the age up just to save not that Social Security, it's very easy to solve the financial problems of Social Security through raising who pays into the system. They don't want to do that because that would be a new tax. So rather you, you raise the age, which will differentially affect people based on gender, class, and race. And they don't see that. They just assume everybody is sort of like them, kind of rich white men 
who don't really need Social Security because they have big pensions, retirement funds, and they can keep on working until they're 80 or 90 because their job doesn't involve physical labor. They don't even have to go to Congress. They, you know, they, they can just hang out. So, will any, Martha, will any of this be solved by getting more women into politics or legislative discussions? Well, well, if you think back to what Ruth Bader Ginsburg did years ago, when it was the case of a, a kids, a young girls being searched for contraband, you know, and she said, as a woman, I can tell you, a younger teenager to be patted down is terrible. And she and the men never thought about that, didn't enter their minds. So the more we have people who are aware of um, these inequalities, that men could, these what men in Congress could work forever, that they have good pensions, they always earned enough money that they can save, and now we get blamed because we haven't saved enough money. And what we give people are individualistic solutions. We're going to teach women how to do financial planning. You know, we're going to teach them how to manage their money. But what assumption does that make? That they have money to manage, and they earn enough to save it. And that it's the whole set of assumptions that are built into that, that rarely get exposed. Mm-hmm. And that's, so is it, that's why the intersectionality is so important. Right. And so is the work that you're doing now exposing all of that? How are you, how are you making it happen? Well, Dale, I, I'm, at the moment, I'm not doing any of that right now. Right now, I'm writing a book about my maternal grandparents who were killed in the Holocaust. Oh so I'm, so I'm oh. living in the 1930s, early 1940s. The last major talk I gave about this was in Canada about a year ago, last May. And, you know, why chastised sort of neo- neoliberal politics, you know, the notion that the private sector could take care of all of this, or the individual, in, you think about the whole emotion about leaning in, and a lot of liberal women picked up the leaning in idea. Well, leaning in is only made for privileged women. Mm-hmm. Uh, Think about the woman who works at the dollar store. How is she going to lean in? Who is she going to lean into? To? She doesn't even know who her boss is. She'll lose her job in a minute. So instead of trying to fix the structural problems that keep her beaten down, low wages, no respect, they tell her to lean. You solve the problem. You go do. You lean in. You go take care of it. Don't be timid. Well, she's not Sarah Sandberg. She can't confront her boss because she doesn't even know who her boss is usually. So I just try to raise awareness for people that they think about these things, that, that this is a we, people got so in, intensely enthusiastic about this leaning in that it's, you have to recognize it's a pr- place for privileged women only, not, uh, not home care workers, not retail clerks at Walmarts, uh, these people, they'll lose their job in a minute. Now, we have to change, the, change as you know, minimum wage, sick, sick leave, child care. We, we have, in order to make their lives better, it requires a political solution, not an individual solution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So I, I'd like to take you back to the, the, this book, yes. which I wish I'd had when I was teaching women's issues. Um, it's a fabulous book. And uh, it, the second chapter is Ageism. You're only as old as you feel and other fictions. Well, I, I, my, my favorite quote is from Molly Andrew. She's a British uh, gerontologist. And Molly says, you're not only as old as you feel, you're as old as you are. And when, and it, and when, I, when I talk about that you're only as old as you feel, well, I, I don't know how old I feel. You know, some days when I'm in a lot of pain because of my back, I feel like I'm 110. Other days, I but I never feel like I'm 50 or 60 when I can walk for 10 miles. Um, so is there a particular way to feel at a certain age? And when women say, are you only as old as you feel, often what they mean is they don't feel like the stereotypes. You know, they don't feel incompetent. They don't feel all kinds of other things. So... You're as old as you are. Age, I think the number matters. It's a very old-fashioned way to think. But I have lived far more years than I'm going to live. And I want to make sure 
that I can use those years well, and I don't want to, I don't want to evaluate myself by norms that suit my 50-year-old daughter rather than me at 79. So I think that was one of the, the key messages that I, I took from talking with you a little bit earlier and also reading much of your book, that um, at, at those of us that were really working to kind of dispel the stereotypes, the myths, at the same time, I think your your point about that's not we don't hold us up. We shouldn't hold ourselves up to standards that were intended for younger generations. So, what are our standards? What are our um, aspirations? Our aims? How do we set the agenda? Well, that's and the part standard? of the problem. I don't know the answer uh, because when you when women get together and talk, they love this period of their life. As Susan probably told you. Uh, they love this, you know, the, the, the sense of liberation, the sense of freedom, but we don't set the stereotypes. And it's set by people who are young. Everybody in the 1970s, early 1980s, were trying to say age is not all about decline and loss. We're all in their 40s. And so they were, they were too afraid what was going to happen to them. So they invented productive aging, successful aging, and they set the criteria of how to judge what a good old age was instead of letting us set the criteria. And the reason I think it's so hard for us to set the criteria is nobody listens to us. And people point out, well, look at Nancy Pelosi. She's, what, 79, 80? And what the answer usually is, well, she's different. You know, she's a celebrity. Most of us are not like that. And I don't know how to change it. I wish I did. That was where I got stuck when I was writing. I didn't have any solid way to change that, except more intergenerational um, opportunities where young women can see we really do have some capacity. We still can contribute to the conversation. Uh, my experiment, I live, live on the 16th floor, so I have a lot of elevator time. So I'm in the elevator with a young person. I try to act intelligent. You know, say something small. <laughs> Usually that often. Well, you, well, <laughs> you quote the Wall Street Journal. What do you do in, the, in those few moments? You know, I, you know Gail, with, with our podcast, with our regular podcast and with our Advocates for Women Aging, we really we are trying to, to be uh, the forum, uh, active voices for for aging, and while we haven't articulated a particular set of criteria, we are trying to um, talk with women who have a, a range of views, a range of life experiences, who uh, represent uh, women aging in some pretty um, inspiring ways. What else? What else do you think can be done? Not just our our initiative, but what else can be done? This is what I told you when we when we talked that I'm a great advocate of people owning their age, uh, not trying to say um, I'm not old. You know, you're only as old as you feel. Um, age is just a number uh, be, because more people see us owning our own age. And see that we're really very, we're more different when we're old than when we're young because we've had more years to become who we are, you know. And, but, but there's so few opportunities for us to, I, I, let me back, now that I'm working on this other book, I often go over to people who I've heard give lectures, you know, Holocaust scholars, and I say, I'm working on this. You know, would you be willing to have a conversation with me? And I know the for I, I can see the first thing they go through my mind. What is she? What is she writing this book about? What does she think she knows? She's just an old lady. Uh, and mostly people have been fairly kind, and they said yes. You know, they would meet with me. But it, the I think I told you, Catherine, when we talked on the phone. Our body is a text. People look at us. And they interpret, they decide what we are by what we look like. And it's rarely positive. It's really 
rarely, oh wow, I would I'd love to sit with her for an hour and have a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And when I'm out walking, I don't I can't walk very fast because I have too much pain. So I look very frail when I walk. And so people will interpret me. If I can't walk rapidly and I'm sort of not very graceful anymore, it lets the whole set of assumptions about every other part of me. And I don't know, I wish I had a magic formula and I would change, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> but the more which, well, the more we deny that we're old, um, the more other we, the more we give other people permission to deny it. If I don't respect who I am, why should anybody else respect me? But women get terribly impatient when I say we are old. We are not older. We are old. Uh, and I've had encounters with salespeople, like at cosmetic counselors. And young lady, I said, well, I'm not a young lady. I'm an old lady. No, you're not. Well, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, and they think they're offending me. But I'm declaring that I'm old, you know. You know, the babe. One of my uh, colleagues, in fact, we interviewed her for our series, said she, she was 85, and she said, I used to be growing older, and now I am old. <laughs> right? Yes. Right. And I've been, I've been pondering that. <laughs> and and why do we run, we run from it? Because the stereotypes are so negative. You know, we don't want to be viewed negatively. So we just mm -hmm. say, well, I'm not really, I'm not like that, so I can't be old. Mm -hmm. And then I go around proclaiming I'm old, and then they want me to shut up, you know. So, so uh, Martha, what made you change course to to tackle the Holocaust and to start writing a book about that? Well, I figured about a year or so ago that I said just about everything I have to say about being old and a woman. I mean, I've written a lot. I've done a lot of speaking about it uh, and it's time for a new generation to take over and i we just my sister and i discovered these 200 letters from my maternal grandparents and how do you space 200 letters written by people who are dead and have important things to say about the personal experience of living through those awful times the letters go from 38 to 42 how do you not do something with them so I completely jumped into that and I've done, except for that speech I did in Canada last year, that's all I've been doing for the past two and a half years. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And you said you've been interviewing, uh, having conversations with other people who, who, who have you been talking with? Are, are you well, I've been interviewing mostly uh, uh, Holocaust scholars, um, okay. and either by email or in person. And because I like people to read my things and critique my things. And that's what that writing group, Catherine, and I told you about. They've been mm -hmm. reading right. very diligently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so the, the book is, is it really framed around the, these letters and the experiences well, of I your it's, family? It's what I do because the letters are very personal. They're very intimate. They're written by my mother's parents to my mother. My mother was in the United States. And, but, and so they don't talk about politics at all. So I want to situate their letters in the political environment in which they were writing and all the things they didn't talk about. So each chapter has a background piece that describes the situation of that particular year when they were like 1938, 1939, 1940, and then the letters. So you, so you, you see, that they were so determined to just focus on the personal, their own pain, and their inability to get visas to come to America. And so I do both history and the letters, and then I have people read to make sure I didn't, because I'm, I'm not a Holocaust scholar. I mean, I read a lot, and I want to make sure I don't say things that are, that are outrageous. And right now I'm doing a book proposal, so I'm at that phase doing it. Wonderful. Good luck with it. Thank yeah, you. Very much well, it just, it just, 
I mean, it just feels like there should be young feminist scholars taking over, but my my dismay at gerontology is how non non political it is. I don't mm -hmm. realize in order to make old age better, this is, has to be a strong political undercurrent to deal with issues of inequality. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. Well, we'll do what we can to keep the, that message alive and out there. <laughs> For sure. Yes. Well, I try to, but it doesn't make me very popular sometimes. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're worried about that. No, I'm not. <laughs> By now, I have this secure place in the field, so I, I don't care anymore. I'm not looking for yes. promotion. I'm not going to write another book about it. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Right. Great. Well, anything else you'd like to leave us with, Martha? Any? Well, if if if, we, any, if if you can just bring together some young 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 women and old women, and we can for joint conversation because. It's, it's got to be as people get to know us better as old women, they recognize we're not incompetent. You know, the, the stereotype is we're kind but incompetent. Oh, we're not. And I don't feel I don't feel incompetent. And sometimes I'm really a bitch. You know, I don't always want to be kind. I don't want. To, when you but, when you say younger women, what 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 age groups are you thinking of? Oh, it could be forties, thirties, twenties. Just so long as they begin to see that we are not incompetent. You know, you know that maybe we're a little little less confident technologically. Although I know how to use Zoom. I mean, I know how to use Zoom. look at us. <laughs> That's hardly the most important thing. But that, but that we still, if we're lucky, we still have brains that work. Mm -hmm. Did you talk about uh, intergenerational conversations? How how do you see those happening? Well, I I've, I've been trying to make them happen with no luck, um, because our society is so age graded. You know, everything we you get a driver's to start school at a certain age. You get a driver's license at a certain age. You vote at a certain age, and so there's so few opportunities for people to get together in an intergenerational group. And I'm not so sure. You know, we want to do it because we want to prove that we are have something to say that we're not incompetent. But I don't know that young people want to hear from us at all. I'm finding in the work world. That there is a lot of intergenerational conversation happening. How? How's it, what, what's happening? How is that? How is it happening? So there's an organization called Ageless Innovators, which is part of Chicago Innovation, and their purpose, Ageless Innovators, is to bring together uh, younger generation and older generation to comment co mentor each other. And there's a whole format around that that they they use, and that's just one of many intergenerational organizations that are now uh, making more of it, and and you know expecting this this conversation to happen. And does you think it changed changes attitudes? Definitely, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Of course. In, as with any group, the people who join these groups are already believers. Wow. Because I would love to see if they, I'd love to do some sort of a study. They come in at the beginning of the group, what their attitudes are. Do they shift at the end if they've been together for a while? Yes, this particular group does measure the beginning and the end and is creating data good and you know hopefully we'll continue on long enough to create data that is useful and i'm sure it's, a, it's not it's a, it's a slow process but i don't i can't think of any other way and i've talked to other people about it any other way that we can change attitudes toward aging 
and I say that I oppose this sort of rah-rah version, this positive aging, uh, also most of the groups are all one race. We don't have too many interracial groups talking about old age. And so the things that may work for the women that I meet with in Streeterville are very different than you can meet with women who are worried about putting food on the table rather than which what their next trip trip is going to be. Um, and and most of the rah rah, the positive positive stuff is people who don't have to worry about putting food on the table. That's right. Right. Yes. And so your, your talks about intersectionality and your talks about intersectionality and the uh, and and the the aging the broader issues of aging I think are and and how we perceive them I think are very useful and and um, certainly will open up and have opened up a lot of people to a, a greater discussion around this. When I said that when they talk about ethics and aging, they're so focused on individual decision making at the end of life mm -hmm. rather than on big social issues that are ethical, particularly inequality, racial justice. And that's me of the key issues that we need to be focusing on and we need to broaden the way we think about them because feminist philosophers will point out you've got to take into account the context in which people live. You know, I may be, may be able to make good choices about what I eat because I won't starve. Let's say I buy broccoli or kale and I don't get to eat it and it spoils. So I throw it away. I hate, I do. I hate to throw it away, but I'm not going to go hungry. But if I were a poor person, I wouldn't buy broccoli or kale because, because if I threw it away, I have no food for the rest of the month. Exactly. So I can eat healthily. I could go to I could go for a walk every day because I, I look out the window. There's a lake. It's relatively safe. Everybody in my neighborhood wears masks. Uh, well, if I lived in a neighborhood where I be where I couldn't safely take a walk, where nobody wore masks, it would be a very very different ability to kind of age quote successfully. The successful aging paradigm is about all about health measures. And they never looked at the underlying social conditions that shape our health as we get older. And the reason they didn't do it, the, the authors, is because it's much harder, they said it's much harder to change those social conditions than it is to change individual behavior. But you can't change individual behavior if the social conditions don't change, like a decent place to live, adequate money to buy food, that things are so tightly woven with each other. And it's true, it's much harder to change. Look what we're, what we're witnessing right now. Uh, the, I, was, I was sitting up on my roof where there's a deck, and I was looking across the street, and a bunch of guys were working, doing repair work. Well, all my friends were so conscious about hand washing, and about masks, and about this and that. Well, they, these bunch of guys were just hanging out. Nobody had a mask on. They were eating. They were within, within inches of each other. Well, you know, that's that their work doesn't allow them to observe all the things that my friends can observe it, and try to stay healthy. I don't know if any of those, was, I, I don't know who these men are. I just looked at them, you know, eating their lunch. But they were practically on top of each other and on a single mask. So the social conditions, which are so hard to change, um, mm -hmm. precede individual change. Instead, we live in a society where we want individual change and individual responsibility without giving people the preconditions that allow them to be responsible. Eat lots of mm -hmm. kale instead of lots of tortillas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not that I don't like tortillas, but... Yes. <laughs> well, Martha, thank you so much for, for joining us today and sharing your views. Provocative, inspiring. I'm we really appreciate what you're it. Doing, my goodness. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Martha. A pleasure. Really thank a you. pleasure. All right. Nice to meet you both. Thank you.